Hi, I'm Jess, part-time Hobbit, and I'm here to talk to you about Tolkien. It has been a little while since I last did a video in this series, but you guys really seem to like the last one, and I did too. So I am super excited to get into this conversation. For the sake of my sanity and upload schedule, this video is going to be a little bit shorter than my last couple of ones, so I won't be getting too far into Frodo's role as an archetypical character, or the way that he kind of fulfills and defies some classic tropes, but that stuff will absolutely be covered in another video further on down the road, so make sure you stay tuned if you're interested in that sort of thing. Today we're going to look into some of the main differences between Frodo's character in the book and his character in the movies, and talk about why these changes were made and how well they worked. The first major change that was made is Frodo's age. In the books, we meet Frodo on his 33rd birthday, and since Hobbit's age at a relatively similar pace to humans, we can assume that he's meant to be pictured in his human mid-30s. And then, even more importantly, 17 years pass before the main events of the Fellowship get underway. This makes Frodo 50 years old when he departs the Shire. Frodo's age is not specified by Peter Jackson, but Elijah Wood was only 19 when they first started filming the Fellowship, and we're just gonna kind of ignore the uh, existential crisis that sends me spiraling into. Not only that, but Peter Jackson compresses the timeline of fellowship, meaning that Frodo leaves pretty immediately after the birthday party. And I could never argue with the casting of Elijah Wood as Frodo. Big blue. But I think that this change in Frodo's age was kind of the first domino in a long line that led to some pretty major changes in Frodo's character. Especially because they never specify Frodo's age in the movies, we are left to kind of contextualize his age with the actors around him. Dominic Monaghan was only a few years older than Elijah Wood at the time, but both Billy Boyd and Sean Astin were at least a decade older than him at the time of the filming. Still now. I guess I, that's how age works. Right? So not only is Elijah Wood the youngest looking character in their group by a long shot, he was specifically significantly younger looking than Sam, who he would spend most of the movie with. This change has a noticeable effect on the character's dynamic. In the books, Sam is actually 12 years Frodo's junior, so this kind of master-servant dynamic between them really makes a lot of sense. Frodo is the landed gentry. He is wise and older, and and Sam, his young gardener, is there to be a sort of page and aid him along his journey. This is likely a reflection of the medieval knight and page relationships, as well as the relationships between officers in World War I and the privates that assisted them. That last one is particularly pertinent because Tolkien cited it multiple times as the inspiration for Frodo and Sam's relationships based off of his own experiences in World War I. In the books, Frodo is greatly and constantly in need of help, but he definitely is in a leadership role. Meanwhile, in the films, we're left with Sam as a sort of guiding force to Frodo. He's definitely still in the helper role, but instead of feeling like Frodo's servant, he's more of a father figure. This choice is definitely not bad, in my opinion, and the actors certainly pull it off incredibly well. But again, this has ripple effects on Frodo's character. And unfortunately, some of these choices really change changed the essence of Frodo's character and his role in the story. In the books, he is presented as surprisingly bold. While living in the Shire, he follows in his Uncle Bilbo's footsteps, shucking away the conventions of Hobbiton and really following his own path. Once on the road, we see him stand his ground on many occasions, even if it seems totally hopeless. He defends his friends in the Barrows, stands face to face with the Nazgul multiple times, and even faces Shelob the Great head on. Frodo often doubts himself, but he almost always chooses the right path in the end, standing with all of the strength he has in the face of vast evil. Tolkien said it best, Frodo deserved all honor because he spent every drop of his power of will and body, and that was just sufficient to bring him to the destined point and no further. Few others, possibly no others of his time, would have got so far. Frodo is kind of the ideal protagonist. He is humble and flawed, but he shows us that if we are walking on the path intended for us, 
even our humblest efforts will be enough. Now, Frodo of the films has much less backbone. He is shown again and again to fall victim to his fears and weaknesses rather than to challenge them. The success that he does see is often due to his friends and companions being willing to help him out when he falls short. And I think therein lies the lesson of movie Frodo's character. Though he falls again and again, it is the strength of his loved ones that helps him through to the end. I don't think that writing of his character is inherently flawed, but it definitely does differ from Tolkien's version. And some of these changes are likely due to the change in mediums. In the books, we are greeted by this rich internal life from many of the characters, including Frodo. We often get to see not only their actions, but the thoughts that went into those actions. When Frodo chooses to save his companions from the Barrow Whites, we see his doubt firsthand. He heavily considers fleeing, but ultimately comes around to choosing choosing to be brave. And this kind of internal battle is much harder to get across with film. An actor's performance, even one as incredible as Elijah Wood, is limited. An internal battle like this could definitely be translated through visuals and editing, and it has been done very well in many other films. But with the specific directorial and filming choices that Peter Jackson chose, we just don't really get to see this aspect of Frodo's character. Without seeing Frodo go through this internal debate, seeing this young, tiny hobbit face off against some of Middle-earth's greatest evils may have seemed a little unbelievable. Either Frodo could have come across overpowered, or these creatures could have lost some of their fearsome oomph. Rather than having Frodo's journey internalized, Peter Jackson and his team externalized it. He is clearly too weak for the tasks that he faces, but rather than having to go through this internal battle of convincing himself that he is enough, he has his companions to tell him that for him. It is an easier character to tell over film, and it's kind of more impactful within the context. And I find that all of these changes come to a head towards the end of the story. One of the most controversial changes made to Frodo's character takes place in the third film, and that is his and Sam's falling out. While they scale the cliffs at Kirith Ungol, Gollum devises a plan to divide Frodo and Sam by convincing Frodo that Sam has eaten the last of their Lembus bread supply. Already deeply impacted by the ring's corruptive power, Frodo takes the bait and sends Sam away. Sam does come back eventually to save Frodo from Shelob, and the journey kind of continues as it was written in the the book, but this whole interaction was entirely invented by Peter Jackson and his writers. In my case, I'm kind of torn over this one. This conflict does inarguably kind of taint Frodo and Sam's relationship. The characters that Tolkien presents have a bond with each other that is almost stronger than blood. They are side by side and utterly loyal to each other from the moment they leave the Shire until the moment that they come back. And it is one of the most beautiful relationships in literary history. However, and I can already feel the rage wafting at me through my camera. I do see how this relationship could have gotten a little bit boring on screen. The fact is that pretty much every relationship has some kind of conflict, especially when that relationship is being tested by external factors. Say, I don't know, a maniacal ring or a three mile straight vertical hike up razor sharp rocks. I am uncertain that modern audiences, especially those that weren't already familiar with Tolkien's works, would have found this relationship super believable. Not to mention the fact that conflict is interesting. There is so much more drama to sending Sam away and having him heroically return when all seems lost. Watching a relationship fall apart and then be pieced back together all the stronger is just much more interesting to watch on screen. Plus, in the films, Frodo and Sam's plotline is presented a very different way to what it is in the book. In the books, each of the major storylines are divided into their own sections, so that we see the rest of the Fellowship's journey play out in the first half of the book, and then the entirety of Frodo and Sam's journey play out in the second part. This story structure would not have translated well at all to a film medium, so Peter Jackson reshaped the whole thing 
cutting these stories together so that we would get to watch this plot play out simultaneously. And this, although a good choice, did create a problem. I think if they had played out Frodo and Sam's relationship just like it was in the book, alongside all of the intrigue and interpersonal drama of the fellowship side of the story, Frodo and Sam may have kind of fallen flat by comparison. They needed tension. They needed to raise some more questions, hang off a few more cliffs, in order to keep the audience engaged as they flipped from one story to another. Other. And of course, this conflict between Frodo and Sam plays very well into the story that Peter Jackson was trying to tell with Frodo's character. He has only gotten this far due to the help of his friends, especially Sam. Sending Sam away and having Frodo just flounder without him just throws this aspect of his character into a very sharp relief. It becomes obvious that without Sam, Frodo is completely unable to complete his task. Gollum understood this about Frodo and that is why he was chipping away at his relationship with Sam, leaving Frodo entirely alone, scared, broken, and left for dead. Thus, when Sam returns and they complete this quest side by side, carrying each other all the way to the end, it all kind of comes together. Do I think that Peter Jackson's solution to all of this was perfect? No. I just think it's out of character, especially if you consider how they were originally written. But is this sequence very compelling? In my opinion, yes. It is one of the most heart-wrenching moments in the trilogy, and it really adds a lot of fun, crunchy texture to what could have otherwise appeared as a kind of flat relationship. And I want to bring up one last example because I think it kind of rounds out this conversation really well. And that is the scene between Frodo and Gollum at the end, above the fires of Mount Doom. Now, both of these scenes begin very similarly, with Frodo and Gollum wrestling for control of the ring after Frodo has decided that he wants to keep it. Gollum bites off Frodo's finger, reclaims the ring, and celebrates his victory. In the original trilogy, Tolkien writes, And with that, even as his eyes were lifted up to gloat on his prize, he stepped too far, toppled, wavered for a moment on the brink, and then, with a shriek, he fell. Out of the depths came his last wail. Precious! And he was gone. I would show you the clip of this from the movies, but I'm pretty sure that Warner Brothers would hit this video so hard that I personally would cease to exist. Essentially though, in Peter Jackson's version, Frodo tackles Gollum off the side of the cliff. Gollum falls and dies, but by some miracle, Frodo hangs on and is rescued by Sam, pulled back up from that edge in a scene that will never fail to make me sob like a little baby boy. Now, they added this extra spice to the movies because it wasn't that dramatic in the books. I can see how Gollum just kind of having an oopsie and slipping and falling would have kind of seemed anticlimactic in a packed, excited theater. Not to mention, this change drives home the point that they've been making. Frodo fails. He falls, but Sam is there to catch him, to make up for his insufficiencies so that they both can make it to the end together. It is the perfect dramatic end cap to the character that Peter Jackson built. Frodo is weak and flawed, but he is made whole by the love of his friends. However, Tolkien wrote the scene the way that he did for a reason. Ultimately, Gollum's death proves the thesis of the entire trilogy. In Tolkien's world, evil is ultimately and forever self-destructive, and in the end it will fail. Gollum isn't killed by some dramatic NFL tackle off the edge of this cliff. He is absorbed in the shallow and selfish pursuit of power, and he slips and falls. The power that he has clutched to for all of his life fails him in the end, even as he cries its name as he falls to his death. 
But in the Peter Jackson version, this original message is kind of muddied. He doesn't slip and fall due to his own hubris. He is taken down by Frodo, who seems so entirely given to the darkness that he doesn't even acknowledge the possibility of death. We don't get this final message of Frodo finally sitting back and watching evil destroy itself. And I do think that's kind of a shame. Tolkien presents us with this incredibly nuanced conclusion. And in the full, carefully constructed narrative that he presents us with, it is perfectly dramatic and fulfilling. Because Peter Jackson redirected Frodo's character, we don't get to see the full original nuance of the trilogy. But honestly, that's kind of just what adaptation inherently is. You have to make changes to the plots and the characters in order to retell this original story as best you can in a totally different medium. Personally, while I think I get the choices that Peter Jackson made for Frodo's character, I still prefer book Frodo. Ever since I was very, very young, I remember just not really liking Frodo in the movies. He was pretty annoying and incompetent. Of course, as I've grown older, I can recognize that he is probably less annoying and more competent than I am presently, so I, I guess I don't really have that much room to judge. But Tolkien's original character is a little more well-rounded and a little more likable, and that's just who I prefer. But that's just my opinion, and I would love to hear yours. I I have a pretty strong suspicion that most of you are going to agree with me, but whether you do or you don't, I would love to have a conversation about this in the comments. Let me know what changes I missed or if you think that these changes were made for a different reason than I do. Make sure you take just a moment to give this video a like if you haven't yet, and do feel free to subscribe if you like the kind of content I'm doing over here. Thank you all so much for watching, and I hope that you all have a very happy, hobbity day.